Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Kate Bruns, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I am so delighted to introduce this event with Matt Parker, celebrating the US paperback release of his book, Humble Pie, When Math Goes Wrong in the Real World. Now, before I turn things over to Jacob Berendez to introduce this event, I just wanna make a few quick remarks. Tonight's lecture is the most recent installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which brings the authors of recently published science-related literature to our Cambridge community and now quite far beyond it. Uh, to learn more about upcoming science book talks when they're announced, you can sign up for the bookstore's email newsletter at harvard.com, or you can visit the webpage harvard.com slash science. We also have a science research public lecture series YouTube page where you can see previous talks that you might have missed. I will toss all of those links in the Zoom chat in just a few minutes so you don't forget them. This evening's event is going to conclude with some time for your questions. If you would like to ask Matt something, please go to the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen where you can submit a question or feel free to write it directly in the Zoom chat. We're going to get through as many as time allows for this evening. Also, once the event begins, I'm going to post a link to purchase tonight's book, Humble Pie. Now, the first 314 orders of the book will receive a special gift from Matt. He has so generously signed individual pages from Humble Pie's original manuscript. So we're going to be including a signed manuscript in each book order while supplies last. All sales support Harvard Bookstore, so thank you for your patronage. Your purchases and your contributions, I will also be dropping a donate link in the chat, make this series possible, and they ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. So thank you to our partners at Harvard and thank you to all of you for tuning, up, tuning in and showing up for our authors and for the future of independent book selling. Uh, so now I would like to turn things over to the brilliant Jacob Berendez. He is the Director of Graduate Studies for Harvard Faculty of Arts and Sciences Division of Science, the Co-Director of Graduate Studies in the Department of Physics, and a lecturer on physics here at Harvard. So Jacob, the digital podium is all yours. Thanks so much, Kate. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I wanna thank Kate for the really kind introduction. Um, and uh, I wanna thank Matt for being here to talk to all of us today. So I've been a fan of Matt Parker for years. Uh, I first encountered his work watching YouTube videos of my kids. Uh, one of them I remember was a video about a square shaped fractal. Matt, I don't know if you remember this, uh, called the Menger sponge, where he showed that a certain version of the fractal had an area that was exactly pi. Uh, another video, um, I think he built a vortex cannon and fired it at people from a stage. But my favorite one of Matt's YouTube videos is one I'll share right now. Uh, it's, it's uh, if I can get the share screen thing working here, yeah. So, um, so hopefully everyone can see this. Uh, it, it's it's a formula that when you when you plot it, it draws a picture of the formula itself. And in fact, it draws every picture you can imagine. So you know, string theorists take notice. We found a mathematical theory of everything. <laughs> so uh, so Matt Matt Parker has been telling lots of people about math for years. He is undergrad at the University of Western Australia. Uh, he studied engineering, physics, and of course math, uh, and also was interested in comedy. Before this book, he also wrote another book I can heartily recommend uh, called Things to Make and Do in the Fourth Dimension. Matt now has a very popular YouTube channel called Stand Up Maths, which I also recommend to everyone. He's also a frequent guest on various radio and television channels. Uh, he won the 2018 Communications Award of the Joint Policy Board for Mathematics for, quote, communicating the excitement of mathematics to a worldwide audience through YouTube videos, TV and radio appearances, book and newspaper writings, and stand up comedy. Matt's going to talk to us all today about mathematical mistakes. So I, I teach physics classes here at Harvard, and I'm always trying to convince my students that mistakes aren't bad. They're actually good. Making mistakes means we're learning. And in fact, if you aren't making mistakes, then it means you're not stretching yourself. You're not growing. We all make mathematical mistakes. Back when I took the, uh, the GRE test for grad school, I made a really wonderful and hilarious mistake. So let me tell you a little bit about this story. Um, so I got to the testing site and I was recovering from just the worst headache, but the test was going fine. And I'm like, this is, this is good. I'm, I'm going to be fine. And then I got to this question here that I'll share with you. Okay. So this was the question. I remember it like it, it was like it was yesterday. 
Uh, it's one of these questions where you're given two quantities, column A and column B, and you're supposed to you know, write an A if the answer to A is a bigger number, and B if the answer to B is a bigger number, or C if they're equal, or D if there's not enough information. Now, if my experience sharing this story with physics students holds up, many of you from maybe a more physics background at least, uh, might be just as confused with this problem as I was. What's going on there with column B? Is that, is that a coordinate pair? Is it a vector? But wait, there aren't supposed to be vectors on this test. What's going on with, with those parentheses? What's that comma? Is that a typo? So I ended up putting D, not enough information. And I asked all my floor mates in college what they thought. They were also physics majors, and they all agreed that something must have been wrong with the test. Well, so I, I ended up writing a letter to the Educational Testing Service explaining that their test had some sort of a typo in it. I later told the story at a dinner, many months later, my father-in-law, he's an actuary. Uh, he listened to me and then he paused for a second and he said, wait, isn't that just 121,121? <laughs> so we all make mathematical mistakes. And if we're lucky, all they do is give us a funny story we can tell years later. Maybe they can even humble us, which let's be honest, a lot of us need. In some cases, they can cause serious accidents, which we don't need. Either way, it's worth taking some serious time to think about mathematical mistakes and to eat some humble pie. <laughs> Matt, it's great to have you here. I'm really looking forward to your talk. Please take it away. Okay, so um, before the talk, Jacob showed me that slide and gave me the first half of the story and I had exactly the same response. I was like, that's got to be like a vector or a terrible attempt at typesetting a matrix. And I had no, I honestly hadn't even crossed my mind that was a comma in the middle of a number. That's, that is spectacular. Um, and actually, I think physics, I remember um, dabbling in a bit of physics. And what I liked about it was it was good for mathematicians to wean us of uh, uh, undue levels of precision and stressing about accuracy. So I remember two big uh, important moments for me in my physics math, math career was realizing when you, you only care about the order of magnitude. And actually that's a concept that came up in my most recent YouTube video, which I can see people in the comments have already mentioned that they just watched. So welcome. It's like watching more of it. Uh, and also the fact that um, for some calculations, they're like, well, let's just make C equal to one and G equal to one and everything equal to one. And then we'll, we'll see what we get out the other side. And as you know, the, the mathematician in me was horrified by this, um, but eventually I grew to love the lack of precision um, in the world of physics. So um, Jacob, thank you very much for um, reminding me of my uh, less accurate physics days. Anyway, uh, thank you so much everyone for coming along. I can see the chat uh, going along next to me. I will address some of that in a moment. I, I just thought I'd, I'd establish what's going on for anyone who's unfamiliar with um, these things. So my name is Matt Parker. I am a mathematics uh, communicator, I think is the most general way to put that. I used to be a high school math teacher back in the day. My accent sounds British. I'm actually from Australia, but I moved to the UK like a one and a half decades ago. So my accent, to be honest, is technically now a British accent, but to British people, I sound Australian, uh, and to Australian people, I sound British, and to Americans, I sound confusing. So uh, I won't be offended if you think I'm uh, either of those. And technically on paper, I've now got my British um, citizenship, so it's okay. Um, so however, I've left my previous career of uh, being a high school math teacher, to, which because I taught in Australia and in the UK and now I do all forms of communication and we're here to talk about here we go I've got one within reach I have a lot of these uh, humble pie uh, this is the US edition which a lot of people have asked what's the difference it's basically because the U oh I have got one here we go that's that's like the UK one and that's the same one in Australia and it's obviously my working one I think I spilt coffee on that at some point uh, and so these are the same this one's got more s's and this one's got more z's that's the, the primary difference between the two. But the content's the same. The grammar has just been redone um, and co commas have been moved around depending on local conventions um, and the like. And so, uh, so when the paperback came out, which was, came out last week in the US, uh, Harvard Bookstore got in touch and said, hey, would you like to come along and do a talk? And I was very excited because I, actually, I think I, I'll go to this now. Uh, there's me, the last time 
that I was at a Harvard bookstore. It's actually, can I, I'm going to bring in, oops, what have I done there? Oh, wrong way around. There we go. I've got a ridiculous setup. I can now drive myself around. Isn't this deeply pleasing? Uh, so anyway, uh, this is the last time I was in Cambridge. Oh, no, it's not. Two times ago. I was last in Cambridge pretty much exactly 12 months ago. I was over uh, for a couple of reasons involving the MIT mystery hunt, which was uh, the puzzle hunt, which was all done online this year, which I enjoyed immensely. I think this was two visits ago. Uh, I love coming over. That, uh, that is my friend and a Fry's book. I think I can make the same express. Now it's a symmetric picture in picture. There you are. So I'm trying to have a relaxing vacation and uh, my friend is in the book display. I, not in the book display. So Harvard, bookstore, bear that in mind. I take that personally. Um, so anyway, when they, so I knew the store, I bought books there. And when they said, do you want to do a talk? I thought that'd be very exciting. And it's something to celebrate um, the paperback launch of Humble Pie. Um, now, the way, what, I'm, what I thought I would do here, we're going to do a combination of a couple of things. I've got things from the book I can talk about and I can show you. So we'll do a few of those. I've um, also got the chat going on. Uh, I've got a screen off to the side so I can see the chat coming through. And I will um, uh, dip in and out of that. If the chat is distracting for you, little pro tip, if you pop it out into a separate window, you can then just drag that pretty much off the screen and you won't see the notifications, you won't see the chat, it won't distract you as the talk goes along because it can get uh, pretty uh, uh, distracting when those people are doing it. And we've got the uh, Q&A. So you can, for some reason, that's a whole separate channel of communication. So if you want to put a Q in and see if I will A it, uh, you can put it in the separate Q&A. And I can take care of 50% of the current questions. Oh, I can click answer live. What does that do? I've never done that before in a Zoom call. Answer live. Uh, it says, will this talk be recorded and made available later? Yes. As uh, Kate was saying earlier on, it will be made available through the Harvard Bookstore's uh, science series, something, um, which will be on, uh, on the YouTube and done. I don't know what happens if I click start and stop when I answer the question. I assume that's archived somewhere. Um, so I will dip in, in and out of the Q&A if you want to get involved in that and the chat. So someone has already said, uh, thank you for saying math instead of maths. I attempt to be bilingual. So in Australia, it's maths, plural. In the UK, it's maths, plural. And then in America, it's math. But whenever I'm in the States, and I count this as being um, temporarily in the States, very sadly, not been over for a while, um, I say math. I, I flip. I flip back over. And I, just for the purposes of being understood, I haven't got a strong opinion. I prefer maths. But I think it's because I grew up with it. People get very emotional about it, though. And I would take all the arguments for math a lot more seriously if in America uh, you called physics physic. I mean, choose a choose a pluralization continent. Come on. So, uh, so for me, hearing math feels a bit like hearing physic instead of physics. But you know, um, I'm happy to go with it. Okay. So uh, apparently, if I answer a Q and A question, it's archived for attendees to see in the Q and A chat box. There you are. So. Uh, someone in, in the chat has been answering my questions involving a question I answered. So we're currently uh, two layers of Q&A deep, for those of you keeping uh, track of the fra fractal dimension of this talk. Okay, so I'm going to start with some show and tell. Um, and then I'll come back over to the chat. And to be honest, the rest of the talk, I can take requests of things people would like to see. So I thought I'd start by um, showing something I'm very uh, excited about. And it's, uh, it's an educational poster from when I was a teacher. And one of the great things about being a teacher, you put posters up in the room, great fun. Uh, and this one, I, I think is just incredible. So uh, this, um, so let, let me break this down for you, piece by piece. It says, uh, education works when all the parts, uh, I'll put myself over there, uh, are working. And then you've got, you can see, you've got a cog uh, for teachers, you've got a cog for parents, and you've got a cog for students. And you could imagine, like, uh, teachers, moving in a nice, like, let's say, uh, clockwise direction, and they're meshing with students that are going in a lovely counterclockwise direction. But of course, nothing's going anywhere because parents jammed in the bottom there, clogging the whole system up. It's a very accurate poster in my uh, humble 
uh, experience, right? And so when I saw this, I was like, that is uh, absolutely amazing. That is such a, oh, hang on, I'm gonna, let's wipe. Oh, this, oh, I'm gonna go this way, there we go. Uh, 10 to 15% of the talk would be me adjusting uh, my vision mixer because um, I enjoy it. So anyway, so I saw this poster and I had to get a copy of it. I think it's so funny. And uh, since then, I've collected examples of when people have geometrically inaccurate clip art, or more generally, just geometrically inaccurate representations of things. And even more, more general again, I just love examples of when people haven't thought through the geometry of a situation. And this hobby came in, for once it was practical, when I was writing a book about math mistakes, I was like, oh my goodness, I can draw on my lifelong hobby of collecting examples of when people didn't think through geometry and cogs, amazing. Uh, this one here was used by Manchester, which is a city in the north of England, where um, the, anything above London is the north of England, by the way, where uh, this was, they were redoing their public transport system. And this was the slogan they went with, uh, making the city work together, no. And actually, if you'd seen the trams they ended up with, that's not um, inaccurate either. Now, a lot of people online, very quick to point out, that uh, this can work if you go to 3D. So it, we're just, we're limiting ourselves being one dimension too low. So there's your 2D, looks like it's all locked together, bam, 3D, works, works fine. You just, you're not thinking in enough dimensions. Um, and then there's this one. So this is a picture from USA Today. And this was back at the beginning of the Trump administration. I hate to um, get you all nostalgic for that, uh, but very early on. Uh, the Trump administration were going to renegotiate the North America Free Trade Agreement and USA Today ran this diagram and I genuinely don't know if they're trying to indicate that it should be easy and all the countries are going to move together like clockwork or if it's going to be impossible and gridlocked and it's already in 3D so there's none of this cheeky other dimension malarkey you can't uh, you can't, I was using the word malarkey before it was cool by the way um, you can't get out of that. Uh, that's just someone who has not thought through the geometry of that situation. And I was so amazed when I saw that, that I, oh, I have got it here. I paid my own money to license that image because my publisher uh, said no. Uh, so I paid my own cash and I've got it here because uh, I, want, I wanted to put it in my book in the section about geometry uh, with the caption, making cogs great again. Oh, come on. Is that not? Uh, let me see if I can, there you go, I can manually focus. Making cogs great again, I think we can all agree, money well spent. I mean, it was pretty hilarious and topical at the time, I stand by it um, to this day. Uh, someone has said, are there 3D analogs to gears that jam after a certain amount of meshing? Huh, is that question saying, because cogs are arguably a 2D object, and if you get three of them, you've now run out of degrees of freedom. Are you saying if you had like spiky spheres or something, how many would it take to lock up? I think that's interesting because you've got different numbers of axes of rotation. So in 2D, you've only got one axis of rotation. So if you've got a cog, you can only go that way. If you've got a sphere, you've now got three. You can go that way, that way, um, and that way. And if you had a 4D cog, you'd have six axes of rotation, but depending on how the meshing works, because in 2D, you're only ever, actually, you know, let me bring back up a picture. What's a good one? Ah, oh, here we go. So in um, 2D, you're only ever, uh, there's only one option where the teeth are locked together and you can't rotate either way. But in 3D, you could imagine a meshing arrangement where it locks one way, but it's free to move in the other direction. And I don't know if, anyone's ever thought through what would happen um, for 3D. It would depend. You'd have more than one type of meshing. I hope that's an adequate long... Someone's already got a pull quote. If you had spiky spheres, quote unquote, Matt Parker. No, none of this, none of this is on the record. This is going on YouTube, isn't it? Yeah, it's all going to be on the record. Um, anyway, so I, I sent the book out. And actually, in the book, I put out an appeal, put out several appeals, uh, one of them was to send me more interesting examples of where people haven't thought through geometry. And oh, I've got the um, I've got the license plates uh, from uh, Texas, which I think are very funny, where you can just see over here that there's like a, a moon on the plates. And if you zoom in, 
and I, I filled this in. I had to buy one so I could uh, scan it in high enough resolution to fill in the rest of the moon and check what's going on. Um, but if you fill it in, that star, you should be able to see that. It should be behind the moon. The moon's a sphere. It doesn't suddenly disappear just because it's not lit. These plates are wrong because of that lone star. Huh. Uh, and then over here, uh, this is, I've, I love locks. I don't know if anyone, I mean, there's a fantastic YouTube channel called The Lock Picking Lawyer. Uh, and there's loads of other ones, which, because Lock Picking Lawyer, there's a lot of picking, but then some general security issues. There's other channels that do more like, um, uh, not penetration testing, but like um, uh, physical security stuff. And uh, I think I find it fascinating and I love it. And a lot of it is exploiting when people haven't thought through the geometry of a lock or where like the strike plate is or how you can reach around and get things. And a lot of security measures are, are based around changing the geometry of a door and its hinges and the latch and all this stuff, fascinating. And so I put in just a lazy example here of a correctly installed padlock and an incorrectly installed padlock. And I think these, uh, whenever I see one of these in, in the world, real life, I think it's just incredible because someone's just not thought through you don't need a key now. Anyone can just show up with a screwdriver. You meant because they're not meant to be exposed screw heads, but you see this all the time. I just I bought these and made it myself. Little mock up um, because I wanted to be able to just take a photo of both and uh, put it in the book. And I couldn't um, find any good enough photos I've taken of them in the real world. And then someone posted me. It was delightfully old school. They uh, sent me this catalog, expert, um, what to buy catalog. And I flicked through and they'd give me a letter and they specifically sent me this here. So this is the ultra strong, give me a moment everyone. So I'll bring it up real close. So you can see. Ultra strong bolt with uh, integral, integral hmm, uh, combination lock. And I think we could all see the issue going on there. You install that on people are like, oh my goodness, if I don't know the code, what kind of exploit could there possibly be to get this off? without knowing the code. Like it's got like six exposed screws. And you might think, well, hang on. Like, Cause the other one, when, when it's like a latch, that's user error, poorly installed. This is the actual product design that's not been done properly. And so I bought one, here it is. Uh, this, my accountant has a lot of fun with my receipts every year. And so technically a work expense. Cause I thought maybe there was meant to be covers or there was something else. No, this is, it, I followed the instructions other than, I mean, I think I'm using it on a smaller door than is recommended. But other than that, I installed it exactly the way that I was told to do it by the instructions. And look at that. You can just walk up to that with anything that's sufficiently similar to a screwdriver um, and you're in. So anyway, that's, so if you do come across other examples, send them in to me. These are at the playful end, the, 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 the trivial and fun end of math mistakes where there's a lot of, well, I guess there's some security issues for some of them, but there's no major problems. Um, however, I wanted the book to run the full spectrum between just kind of fun, playful math mistakes right through to ones with very serious ramifications. And the, the whole premise of the book, the whole reason why I wanted to write a book about math mistakes was kind of twofold. One was I'd written my previous book, things to make him do in the fourth dimension, which Jacob very kindly mentioned before, and it has Tupper's self-referential formula in it. That's amazing. And uh, that was great, good book. It's very much targeted at the pre-math enthusiastic. It's for nerds and proto-nerds. Uh, and then my publisher was like, hey, great, that sold, uh, it sold great for a math book. It sold average for a book. And the publishers, to be fair, in the <laughs> they're in the job of just selling books. And they're like, right, what are you gonna write that can hit a wider audience? And that aligns with my goals because I wanna get as many people excited about math as possible. And I'd already kind of catered for the slightly uh, math curious crowd. Now I wanted to widen the remit. I thought, you know what? Everyone loves stories of things going wrong. And so I thought I could write a whole book about math mistakes as an excuse to talk about how vital math is. And so by pointing out when it goes wrong, that's my gateway to talk about how much math goes on behind the scenes and technology and finance, and programming, every, everything around us, engineering, you name it, physics, I believe, uh, it's all math based. And so uh, because I could look at mistakes from such a wide range of different um, fields, 
each time I could then use it as an excuse to explore the math behind that field. And by filling it with stories of things going wrong, it would appear to a wide audience and uh, people would enjoy uh, reading it. That was the theory. And so the geometry stuff is deliberately uh, light because I can't, like a lot of the times in like engineering and aviation, if you have a math mistake, everybody dies and it's super uh, depressing. And so I had to, I had to put some in because I didn't want to uh, skirt the fact that if you're doing engineering or, or you know, aviation or something or medicine, you need to know the math. Super important. People's lives are on the line. But on the other side, I promised that it would be a comedy book about mathematics. And so that's why I go right across the range. And if you have any other examples of people getting geometry and math wrong, please do send them in to me. Oops, I just kicked my um, camera. Sorry about that. Uh, and I would love uh, to see them. Okay, so you know what? I'm going to have a quick flick through the, the uh, Q&A. It, sorry, the, um, the chat. If you want to request, if anyone already knows the book or you've already seen my videos, if you want to request anything, you are very welcome to put it in there. Uh, and I'm going to have a look at the Q&A because I think we have eight specific questions in the Q&A. I will pick out uh, two of them and then I will um, uh, go into the chat to see if you have any requests. So I got distracted by thinking about them. So here's one which um, I'm going to answer live. Now I know how the buttons work. Have you ever played Minecraft before doing the video? So I thought I'd answer this one now because there's been a few references to my most recent video. And that was a video where I looked at a controversy in speedrunning Minecraft. So people who aren't familiar with this, speedrunning is people try to finish video games as fast as possible. It's very popular. People do it on modern games. People do it a lot on retro games. And I tend to watch retro, like, NES, you know, uh, Sega Genesis kind of um, speed runs, but people do them on all different games and systems. And there's a big controversy over someone who got ridiculously good luck while speed running Minecraft, a player called uh, Dream. And Dream's very popular, they do great uploads, fantastic YouTuber. And suddenly, when they sent in one of their times for a world record, the mod team, the people, the moderators behind the board who put out the, the um, official times, said, no, they were too lucky. And I won't go into the math here. It's all in the video. Uh, we, the way you can analyze the stats to say, if something has a certain probability of happening, and then it happens this many times in, in the live streams, can we put a bound on how likely that was to happen overall? And it's fascinating mathematics, but I like the general concept of um, how lucky is too lucky. That's the whole idea. And so the video, I only finished filming it yesterday morning. I've actually left my study set up. This is everything as it was. And I don't know if anyone did watch it, the very closing scene, I throw a dart at a dartboard that, that I haven't moved it. So that's the same dart is still there on the dartboard. And the basketball, there's several scenes where I talk to camera. I'm not gonna be able to do this live. Um, I talk to camera and I'm like, uh, blah, 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 blah. Wouldn't it be amazing if I was just incredibly lucky and I throw it over my shoulder, uh, too high. Hang on a second, but too low. Uh, the rest of the talk, just this. Here we go, ready? But yeah, here we are. So that's how it's done. And so in one of the scenes, I sit here and I throw uh, four in without looking while I'm talking to camera in one long unedited take. And the whole idea was when I, because loads of people requested I do a video about Dream, like so many people. And suddenly, loads of young people were interested in stats and analyzing p-values. And I was like, oh my goodness, I, it would be a dereliction of duty if I didn't make a video about this, given there's a whole new audience of people who want to learn math and statistics. And so, but I, I wanted, I always, and this is me straying down to like math communication, I really wanted to do something to make the video interesting. It's not just me analyzing the stats. And I like to do things that, that not <laughs> subtle is not the right word here, but uh, in parallel to what I'm actually doing, the way that I'm making the video also illustrates the point I'm trying to make. And so I just wanted to get people thinking about, well, how on earth am I able to sit here and get so lucky? And just get people thinking about, well, how many times did Matt film that? How many times could he film that? How long was each take? How many could he do? All these things. And so I was doing that as in just a way to get people thinking about the principles behind the video. Literally uh, five minutes before 
I signed in to uh, have a, the pre-chat with Kate and Jacob. I finished saving out the over six hours of takes it took to get all the various shots in that video. So spoiler, because I haven't mentioned this anywhere else, just over six hours of takes. And I'm going to upload them all. That's going to take a while. It's one, one long video for my Patreon supporters. So if you support me on Patreon, you, you can watch every single take of every single part of that video and watch me go gently uh, insane as I try to get it all done. Um, the one thing I didn't do though, building up to the actual question, I didn't actually play Minecraft to get the footage to put in that video because I was too busy learning how to throw a basketball over my shoulder with two calibration shots. I think we can all agree that's acceptable. Um, and so a friend of mine, Oliver Dunk, who's already into Minecraft, did all the playing and did all the screen capturing and sent it all to me and we worked together uh, to put that bit of the video together. So that's, I think we can all agree, that question answered. Good job. Uh, and now people in the chat saying fake Minecraft gameplay video isn't, that wasn't fake gameplay. Ollie actually did speed runs of 116 to get the footage. So it was legit. We did put a copy of Humble Pie in Minecraft. It's in the blacksmith uh, chest, but hey, what are you gonna do? Uh, question, Matt, do you watch How Ridiculous channel? I do watch the How Ridiculous folks. So if you're unfamiliar with this, there's a few channels. There's one called Dude Perfect. I'm, I'm team How Ridiculous. And the channels are generally based around doing ridiculous things and just doing them until they actually work. And How Ridiculous, uh, uh, three guys from Perth in Australia, where I'm also from. And so I've got an affinity there, but they travel around the world and they do similar videos where like you throw a basketball off like the top of a football stadium and go, oh, that was how, no, Dude Perfect did that one. Ah, they do that sort of thing. Um, and I think it's absolutely fascinating. And if you've seen their videos where they drop things off a gravity tower, there's this big leaning tower and they drop things into like a massive sand pit at the bottom. That's actually at the Jin Jin uh, physics, like there's a gravity center. Oh goodness, two decades before they started filming that. I, when I was an undergraduate at the University of Western Australia, did some work at, on that Jin Jin site and so the first time I saw it on YouTube, I had to do a double take. I was like, that's, that's that place when I was at university. Uh, and no, that's, that's uh, how ridiculous. There you go. Uh, did you have a mirror behind the camera so you can see behind you? No, but I had a monitor. I had a screen. So when I'm um, throwing stuff over my shoulder or doing whatever, I've got a screen in front of me so I can see what's going on behind me. But it's difficult. I don't want to break the eye line when I'm looking down the lens because it's a bit sad. I don't like YouTube videos where you're watching someone talk and then they um, are looking like this because they're reading or looking at something else. Isn't that weird? I'm looking not quite at the camera. And so I kind of put a screen right behind the camera so I can vaguely check. Although the basketball one, it's hard to tell if it's gone in or not. Because if it just bangs off, off the ring, it's hard to know, did, was it the back of the ring and in or was it the front and off? So you, I just had to finish the takes and hope for the best. Okay, I'm gonna show you uh, something a bit different, uh, questions, everything, can, chat can keep piling up. I want to talk about spreadsheets for a second. Um, and sp uh, spreadsheets, again, another obsession of mine. I absolutely love spreadsheets. I'm a real recreational spreadsheet user. I have a video on YouTube um, with now like millions of views of me showing a spreadsheet in like a comedy show in front of a big audience. Uh, it's uh, it, It's good. What's not to like about that? What I've made some very astute career choices. I have not. I have random walked my way into this career. Uh, anyway, so when I was putting the book together, I was like, I am having spreadsheet mistakes. And so I looked into some research for what percentage of spreadsheets contain mistakes. How would you, how would you even know? How, how would you be able to calculate what percentage of spreadsheets have mistakes? How are you going to get access to these spreadsheets? How are you going to find these mistakes? Well, people do it. In fact, I would like to introduce you to the European Spreadsheet Risks Interest Group. Real organization, big fan. Uh, it's pronounced USPRIG. I've uh, not gone to their conference, but it's on my list. And so USPRIG and their members do a lot of research into spreadsheets going wrong. Isn't that amazing? And so what they have found is that uh, roughly 
of all spreadsheets contain a mistake. And they work that out by waiting until a lot of spreadsheets uh, escape into the wild. Because if you go to a business and say, hey, business, can we look at all your spreadsheets so we can point out all the mistakes? Businesses say no. However, if you wait for a business to accidentally release all its spreadsheets, now you're in business. And when during like the Enron scandal in the court proceedings afterwards, the emails, internal emails from Enron were entered into evidence. And I don't understand the legality of this, but somehow a redacted version of them ended up in the public domain as part of the public investigation into what happened to Enron. And uh, when uh, spreadsheet researchers went through them, they found 15,770 spreadsheets, which were attachments to those emails. In fact, they found 68,979 emails that pertained to those spreadsheets. And so now they suddenly had tens of thousands, well, one and a half tens of thousands of spreadsheets just accidentally released from a company, admittedly, a company whose finances were not exactly beyond reproach. So I'm not saying it's a totally unbiased sample, but it's as good as we're going to get. And so that, that's what they do. And then they, they analyze those spreadsheets. They can go through them manually. You can automate processes. You can search for things. And that's how they found that over, and not just that corpus of spreadsheets, but other ones as well. That's how they found that 90% of all spreadsheets make uh, some kind of mistake. I was interested in what percentage of spreadsheets have arguably a, a proper math error where the spreadsheet is not just being used as a glorified uh, Word document, right? People just aren't just, you know, entering text, they're actually doing some kind of calculation. And so I looked up all the spreadsheets from that they had in their research, which had a formula in it, which had gone wrong. And of all spreadsheets that contain one or more mathematical formulas, 24% of them contain a mathematical calculation error within those formulas. And so that formulae, eh, whatever, uh, it's not English mistakes. And so uh, there you are, one in four spreadsheets that do math have a mistake in them, as far as we can tell from sampling. And that's just, I just find that absolutely astounding. Um, and even if you're not doing math, it can go wrong. So uh, this, is a protein that uh, humans need. Um, and I don't, I don't know uh, how to pronounce it. Any biologists, let me know. Uh, that's the best I can do for you. Uh, and so you've got a, a gene, uh, or is it the gene name? I think that might be the gene name. Hmm. Let's go with that's the gene name, shall we? Uh, uh, bit, biologists don't use the long name. They use a short name. They just call it March 5. That's the name of the gene. And you think, hang on. If I was to type my gene name, March 5, into Excel, is it going to hang around as a gene name? No. Excel sees March 5 and goes, that, that's a date. And it turns it into a date. And it's not just like it formats it so it looks like that. It obliterates the original data and it puts in, at least in my version of Excel, this instead. And so anything which has a name that looks like a date, if you put it into Excel, Excel will turn it into a date and destroy the data. And it doesn't just happen to that one. There are loads of these. So uh, this one here, that's another protein. It's got another fancy name. That's shortened to SEP15. Where's that going to go in Excel? Bam, there you go. And when I wrote the book, this was a big problem. I say a big problem. Um, well, okay, here's a question. What percentage of genetics research is done in spreadsheets such that an auto formatting error can occur because a name of a gene looks too much like a date. And I've got a percentage here, I'm going to share it with you, because some researchers in Melbourne, in Australia, in 2016, went to all the publicly available uh, genome, uh, genetic, meh, bunch of research between 2005 and 2015, took a decade's worth of research. From that, they found uh, 35,175 spreadsheets that were relating to 3,000 597 pieces of research. So that's three and a half thousand pieces of genetics research that have on average 10 spreadsheets each. They then auto scanned the spreadsheets to look for the fingerprint of autocorrects in the past. And they may not necessarily be in Excel now, but at some point in that data's history, it would have been put in Excel, 
autocorrect gets fossilized in and then it gets moved on to a different format. And you can still see that fingerprint of having been previously autocorrected. And the percentage of genetics research that has an auto format error in its data, 19.6%. There you go, one in five, terrifying. Uh, it's since been fixed. So since I wrote the book, it, oh, it's not been fixed because Excel fixed it. Microsoft's comment at the time was something like, uh, the default settings in Excel are fine for most like everyday use scenarios or use cases, basically saying this is not an everyday use case, but scientists are always gonna use Excel. Um, it's been fixed because they renamed the human genes. The body in charge of naming human genes internationally went, you know what? We're gonna rename human genes because that's the best way to fix the problem that they get autocorrected in Excel. So any human gene that had a name that used to be confused with a date has now been renamed as of uh, 2020, last year. One of the many great things to come out of 2020. And so I think I think that's just incredible. And um, spreadsheets, love them or hate them. You can't, you can't avoid them. And so I used it as a nice way to talk about a little bit as an entryway into database mistakes, a little bit of programming mistakes and dividing by zero mistakes and just everyday relatable mistakes because a lot of people use Excel. And so I loved putting those stories um, in the book. Okay, we have not got, uh, oh, someone said, when you say 2020, do you mean the year or the gene? I can't tell if that's a silly joke or a very smart joke because there's actually a gene called 2020. I'm gonna go with there's probably a gene called 2020 because um, that seems to be what biology do. Um, people are now saying Bill Gates is happy he didn't have to fix it himself. Yeah, very busy fitting, I believe, uh, tiny spreadsheets into the vaccine. Uh, and people say, oh, you can turn off auto formatting. You can, some of it. I've not talked about, Excel has issues with putting in very long numbers that get turned into scientific notation. And I believe there's no way to easily turn that off. And that's a problem when you've got large numbers in data going into a spreadsheet, Excel will convert it into a scientific notation and totally obliterate the underlying data and then you've lost it. And you'll see it a lot when people put like phone numbers or something long in a spreadsheet because they're using it as a database and then it will get corrupted. Uh, for a start, if there's a lead zero on your phone number, <laughs> that's gone. I, many years ago, I had a um, credit card and on the back of it, the three digit code had a lead zero. I haven't got it anymore, so I'm not divulging. Oh, I think I've just given away none of my current cards have a lead zero on the three digits. So and technically I have compromised my security slightly here, but in the past and possibly still, I had a card with a lead zero and a lot of websites, when it says put in the three digit code, the website, the form would take off the lead zero and then say that the code didn't match developers. <laughs> it's not their fault. It's probably a client, isn't it? Uh, is there any features you wished spreadsheets would add? That is a great, great question, Akiva. So Excel has actually added some new features to spreadsheets, and I think they've probably ticked two of my major requests. They've added a new form of lookup. They've, been, they've added X lookup. Love it. Because old V lookup, you would have errors coming into spreadsheets because it wouldn't work if the table it was looking up from wasn't in alphabetical order. Like, why would you have a lookup function that breaks like that? You'd have to use like match or something. Uh, X lookup solves so many of those problems. It's so good. And they also introduced a Lambda function. So you can now name your functions in Excel. And for the proper computer science nerds, it's officially made Excel Turing complete just within the formulas, you don't need VBA, honestly. Uh, just within the spreadsheets, you can now have a Turing complete language because um, you've got uh, a Lambda function, you can name functions, other things. And so uh, actually a friend of mine, Felina Hermes, she is big into Excel as a legitimate programming language. And she, if you think I've done amazing things with Excel, uh, her stuff is off the chart. Um, and so I'll put a link, you know, later on, I'll put, a, I'll look it up when I'm not talking uh, and, and put a link um, in, in there. Uh, just absolutely incredible stuff that, that can be done. 
Um, so there you go. Okay, so now I'm going to, uh, you know, how are we doing for time? Oh, okay. I'm going to go through and do a bunch of Q and A questions from the um, Q and A section. So actually, now let's go Q and A for a while. If you want to add new ones in, I will see if I can go through a bunch of these uh, pretty quickly. Uh, is there a way for anyone who purchased the first hardcover edition to get access to the afterworld without purchasing the latest edition? So the hardcover, I've probably got a copy somewhere. So there's a new thing in, in, the, um, in the US paperback edition. I added a section at the back. So there's, there's a bit at the very end where I put in a bunch of the stories that either I found or happened after I finalized the original copy of the book. And so this is like an expansion. It's like the, the, the update to the book. And I do apologize. There's currently no way to get that other than buying the paperback. I'm going to be honest. That's kind of why my publishers asked me to write it. So people would buy the paperback. That's not an accident. It's not a bug. Sadly, that's a feature. Um, I don't know in the future if there'll be a way to release it. A lot of the stuff in here, I, I, I tweet a lot of it. And I put it on YouTube videos. So um, some of it is it kicking around. Sadly, the only way to get it at the moment is to buy this. So what you want to do is buy it, photocopy that bit. Oh, probably shouldn't say that. Who's got a photocopier? Take a photo on your phone uh, and then give it as a gift to someone else. There you are. Effectively, get your money back. Or go to a library. Go to a library and read it and photocopy it. They'll have a photocopier there too. That's the convenient way to do it. Go to a library, photocopy the new bit, uh, and then put it back. There you are. Um, and the, Spare a thought for people in the UK. The book came out here first. They can't even order it because I hadn't got it. That's not in the UK edition paperback yet. So there you go. Done. Um, are you enjoying your rhombic the decahedron you made with Adam Savage? I am. So I did a video with Adam Savage of Mythbusters fame, who was a super wonderful guy. And I would have been wanting to do a thing together for ages because uh, obviously he's got a lot of very nerdy uh, math interests and i've got a lot of hands-on building interests but i'm not very good at that at all and so the opportunity to work with someone else and so when uh he, he we were discussing ideas i was like i've always wanted to build a uh two-way mirror or the one-way mirror the, one, the thing where you can look through the mirror uh rhombic dodecahedron the greatest of all the dodecahedra and so we built it uh however we filmed that right before the pandemic so I was last over in the States, February, um, just nearly a year ago. We filmed it and then everything kicked off. And so actually I haven't uh, got the bits and put together my own version yet. So, oh, sorry, I keep speaking of being good at physical items. So the answer is I haven't built mine yet. There you are. But uh, the moral of the story is math is not just something to be done theoretically. You can build things, you can 3D print them, you can wire them. Uh, if you're on my YouTube channel, I spent a long time using math and electronics to make my Christmas tree a little excessive this year. And so uh, just because you're into math doesn't mean you can't be onto cool hands-on building hacking projects. So um, definitely get involved in those. Boom, answered. Right. Oh, this is a quick one. Will there be any more calculator unboxing videos? So for the uninitiated on number file, which is an amazing YouTube channel, by the way, number file. So stand up maths is just me. Uh, number file is me and loads of other mathematicians. A guy called Brady Harron runs it. Uh, just a great channel. And we're, because there's loads of people involved, the videos come you know, fast and furious. And so uh, fast and rigorous. This is probably the more accurate way to, wow, fast and rigorous. Remind me to pitch that as a film franchise. Anyway, um, so uh, the videos come out pretty uh, regularly. And for a while I did calculator unboxing videos, which was so much fun to film but they really split the audience. Some people uh, loved them, some people hated them, or I would say didn't get the joke, but some people just did not like them. So we have to be careful when we put them out. The, the problem is though, they have to be filmed in person. Like, so Brady and I love doing them together. We had to think there's no real way to do it remotely. So I'm, I'm afraid, I think we might have one or two in like the archive that we might release one day, like the unreleased calculator unboxings. Uh, but for now, not another thing to blame on the coronavirus. No calculator unboxing videos answered. Uh, okay, let's get down and do. Uh, uh, boring. Oh, sorry, not your question. I'm just thinking I haven't got an exciting answer for a lot of these. 
Uh, oh, here's a good one. Uh, do tell, are your publishers happy with how Humble Pie is doing so far? Yes. Yes, they are. So um, this, I don't know. I mean, I think a lot of publishers, they're normally pretty quiet about this, but uh, uh, number one, oh, international just means not in America. That's, um, that's the translation for international is not America. Uh, so I didn't make the New York Times bestseller list, just missed it, but I was number one on the uh, equivalent, the Sunday Times bestseller list. So the big bestseller list in the UK, it was the first math book or maths book, strictly speaking now, I guess, which was the number one bestseller uh, in the UK. So super excited. And little secret is, I just made a few YouTube videos and mentioned it and that makes a big difference. So partly it's well, it also sold very well, like in legitimate bookstores, but it didn't hurt that people on YouTube bought it as well. And so like so many things in my career, it's entirely dependent on the incredible support of people who watch my videos, buy my books, do all that. Like I wouldn't be doing any of this without, without you all. Thank you very much. Uh, and so it was the number one bestseller. So they were ecstatic. So publishers, um, very happy. Well, um, uh, thankfully, thank you everyone for buying it. And I've just got to write, I've got to write some more books. So uh, there you go. So thank you for everyone who's bought the book. Uh, every, every sale counts because they're all individual sales, right? It's not like wholesale things. It, the, the charts are just individual sales. And even if it doesn't make the bestseller list because it did in the States, the sales figures are still used to determine if people, publishers will release more math books. Like all, all this data and particularly stuff through Amazon and everything, they keep a very close eye on these things. So thank you. If you're buying math books, you, that's one of the best ways to make more math books exist um, in the world. Um, oh, okay, you know, I'm gonna do one more question and then we might bring Jacob, potentially Kate back in again to see if there's anything else they wanna ask or there's a wrap up they wanna do. So I'll do one more question and then either Jacob or Kate can jump in. I'm gonna do, here we go. Um, oh, here, I'll do two, I'll do two. First of all, why are Pringles a hyperbolic paraboloid? Dunno, done, up next. Is it true that a lack of conversion between America system inches and metric system once crashed a NASA probe to Mars? Nobody died. Thank you for clarifying. Good to have some nobody died. It was, it was an uh, uncrewed spacecraft, so nobody died. Uh, yes, yes, but it wasn't NASA's fault. So this is like either the number one or the number two most common math mistake general members of the public would say to me <clears throat> when they hear nothing. That was me coughing because I don't do many talks at the moment. My voice is not used to this. Despite six hours of filming my, <clears throat> you know what, we'll end. I'll do a dart throw at the very end. Wouldn't that be amazing? You know what? I'll get the one from here. At the very end, I'm going to throw it my shoulder. Bam. Bullseye. What a way to go out. Um, so this is like the most common thing that normal humans will say when they hear math mistakes, they go, all oh, unit conversions. And they tend to think it was a mistake in NASA using imperial lengths, like uh, inches and feet, instead of using metric. Um, and I know imperial, there's lots of different names for what it actually is, the old school units <clears throat> that you all love so much. And then instead of using metric. Accurate, actually, both aspects of that are technically wrong. Mm, what a great type of wrong. Number one, it wasn't NASA. NASA used metric. It was the contractor that was doing the work for NASA. And in NASA's, like um, all the sheets specifying how the contractor was to work on the project, uh, it specified metric. And so the contractor was meant to use metric and they used, who was it? I think it might've been Lockheed Martin. I probably shouldn't speculate, blame, on what are probably quite litigious companies, a company, I don't know who it was, uh, used Imperial by accident. And it wasn't distance, it was force. So when a spacecraft is in space, which is the best place for a spacecraft, uh, and you want to reorientate it, you've got a gyroscope inside. So you've got like an inertial thing you can push against to adjust your spacecraft. Very interesting physics and, and engineering and space science. My wife is a space scientist, so I got to Got to add that in. Uh, and occasionally you'll you, you can end up in a situation where you've got too much angular momentum 
in your uh, flywheel or your, your um, gyroscope. And this is super nerve wracking. It's actually my wife, Lucy Green. Um, she's a solar physicist and she works with spacecraft that are looking at the sun. And occasionally they have to do what's called an angular momentum desaturation event, where they've got to slow down the gyroscope because, because of the maneuvers they've done, it's ended up going too fast. And when they slow it down, you've got to use the thrusters a bit to compensate so you don't accidentally move the spacecraft. And it's super nerve wracking when they're doing it because she's worried it might accidentally, and this has happened to spacecraft, get oriented the wrong way. And so then you don't want to, you can lose your spacecraft completely during one of these events. And so when they were doing it for the Mars uh, Climate Orbiter on its way to Mars, the company in charge of that, some aerospace contractor, was meant to keep track of all the forces from the thrusters that had been fired during the angular momentum desaturation events. So when it gets to Mars, NASA can calculate the exact trajectory it's coming in on because that will have changed over the course of the journey because of these correction maneuvers. However, the contractor, when they told NASA the forces involved in the desaturation events, they didn't do it in Newtons, they did it in pound force. Pound force, honestly. And that was the unit mismatch. That's why they got the trajectory wrong. And a half billion dollar spacecraft came in much closer to the surface than they expected. There was more drag from what little, well, there's not much atmosphere on Mars, but there's a bit. Uh, there was too much drag, bam, slammed into the surface. The half a billion dollars gone because of a unit mistake. Oh, that's awkward. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up there. Everyone, this has been absolutely emotional. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I will hang around in a bit and answer some stuff in the chat chat uh, over there. Thank you for coming along. This will end up on YouTube. If you're on YouTube and you're watching this, chuck a comment uh, down below and uh, do check out my Stand Up Mass channel. And I should do a plug, otherwise, hey, what a book. Get that. And I'm going to end. Ready? Bullseye. Here we go. Ready? 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 Close enough. Okay, I'll hand back over to Kate. Uh, thank you very much. That scores points, right? Um, well, thank you once again, Matt, for your time and for this incredibly fun talk that um, definitely brought my tech skills and my video skills to shame. Maybe also my over over the shoulder basketball shots. Um, thank you all of you out there for spending part of your evening with us wherever you are tuning in from. Um, and feel free to learn more about the book and purchase the lovely Humble Pie paperback on harvard.com in the links that are now totally buried in the chat. Um, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, have a great night. Keep reading, keep math in to make that a verb, uh, and please stay well. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>